Hi, this is Mark Coker. I'm the founder of Smashwords, and I want to welcome you to my video here, an introduction to ebook publishing. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to produce, publish, and distribute and sell an ebook. I'm also going to cover the five trends that I think will transform the future of authorship and what these trends mean to you. Um, this video is intended for any writer anywhere in the world who is considering self-publishing an ebook. Um, it's also intended for traditionally published authors who are considering self-publishing. And um, if you're one of the many writers who is, has always approached ebook publishing with a healthy dose of fear and trepidation because you're concerned that ebooks require lots of technical expertise. Um, hopefully by the end of this video you'll see that um, anyone can do it. It's really easy. No technical experience required. So to get started I'll give you some background on, on who I am and, and how I got into this crazy business. Um, this hiker dude here is me. And this is my lovely wife Leslie Ann. Leslie Ann's part of the Smashwords story. When I first met her about 12 years ago, um, her previous job was as a reporter for Soap Opera Weekly magazine. Her job was to visit the sets of the Hollywood soap operas and interview the actors and report on, on what was going on. Um, when I first met her, she was telling me these crazy stories about what went on behind the scenes and how the actors were more crazy behind the camera than they were in front of the camera. I suggested that she write a book about her experiences, and she suggested that we write the book together. And so we did. We moved to Burbank, California, and interviewed about 50 soap opera industry insiders for, and um, collected all their dirt. And then we moved to a cabin in Vermont for four months and fictionalized all their stories uh, into a novel. And this is the product of that effort. After spending a few years doing multiple revision rounds and hiring professional editors and book doctors to help us uh, whip the book into shape, um, and after many, many revisions, we were fortunate enough to find representation from one of the top literary agencies in New York City. And for two years they shopped the book around to all the major publishers of commercial women's fiction, and for two years they got nothing but rejection. As you might imagine, it was a quite a disappointing experience after having spent years working on this project to have a, a publisher just slam the door in our faces was, was really tough. So we evaluated our options. The first option, which I call the rational option, was to give up and admit that we were a failure. And the truth of the matter is, back in these days, 10 years ago, um, if an author couldn't get a traditional publishing deal, they were a failure. Because without a publisher, you didn't have access to the printing press, you didn't have access to their expertise, and you didn't have access, most importantly, to brick and mortar retail distribution. If you couldn't get your book in stores, readers weren't going to discover your book. So I thought about the problem, and the more I studied the problem, um, you know, the matter I got about this, the, the, the problem, I, I came to the conclusion that traditional publishing was broken, that it was no longer serving the needs of authors and readers. One of the big problems with traditional publishing is that these publishers are running a business and they're, they're really in the business of selling books, not necessarily publishing books. They're looking to acquire books that they think have the greatest commercial potential. But the problem with that approach is that even, even with the best educated guesses, they're still only guessing which books are going to sell. They don't really know. They're simply throwing spaghetti against the wall. So they're acquiring books that they think have commercial potential. They're applying their talent to those books, and then 12 to 18 months later, those books appear on retail shelves, and then readers react to the books. And if readers respond positively, then those, go those books go on to sell well. But most books flop. Most books don't sell well. 
which means publishers um, aren't as aren't as good at picking the strong sellers as some people give them credit for. So one of the one of the one of the causes of this problem that I identified is that publishers are unwilling and unable to take a risk on every author. And I imagined the hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of writers around the world who were having their dreams crushed and being denied the opportunity to publish simply because a publisher either didn't see their commercial potential or was simply valuing their book based on its perceived commercial potential. Now, I think books are more valuable than money. I think every book in the world has a right to be published. And this is a pretty radical idea, especially um, if you look at how traditional publishers view the world. So I considered um, a second option here, and I call this the irrational option. And that this was a, under this option, Leslie Ann and I would decide to believe in ourselves, to decide that our book had a right to be published, that we wanted that chance to let readers judge the book. So I mortgaged the house and I tried to fix the problem. Uh, my attempt to fix the problem was Smashwords. So in 2008, um, we launched Smashwords. Smashwords is an ebook publishing and distribution platform. So we make it fast, free, and easy for any writer anywhere in the world to instantly self publish an ebook. The way it works is that you upload a book um, to our system. We instantly convert it into multiple ebook formats. We make it available for sale at a price that you set. We distribute the book to most of the major retailers and we give you lots of free learning materials um, to help you learn to become a more professional author. Um, this is what's happened in the last five years. Um, it's been quite an adventure. The first year, 2008, we published 140 books. Um, 2009, 6,000. Um, today, as I record this video um, in late September 2013, we're publishing over 250,000 books. We're serving over 60,000 authors around the world, and today we're the world's largest distributor of self-published ebooks. So again, here's a, a quick rundown of how Smashwords works. You, um, the only tool that you need to publish an ebook at Smashwords is a word processor. Microsoft Word works great. Um, You'll download the Smashwords Style Guide, which I have right here. It's a free ebook. Um, it teaches you how to format your book and produce your book. You upload it to our servers. We, pr we instantly convert it into multiple ebook formats, make it available for sale. And then we distribute it to major retailers such as the Apple iBookstore, Barnes & Noble, Sony, Kobo, Public Libraries, and many others. You set the price, and we pay you uh, between 60 and 80 percent of the list price. So now let's um, let's talk about five trends that that I think will transform the future of authorship. That it will change the world of publishing and change the world to your favor. The first trend is that reading is moving to screens. Screens are the new paper. Here are some examples of some of those screens. You've got the iPad, a Kindle, um, a Nook, iPhone, there's a Sony reader. Um, even the lowly personal computer is a popular e-reading device. Um, here's some data on um, how the ebook market has grown over the last few years here in the United States. Back in around 2005, when I first started working on the Smashwords business plan, ebooks accounted for about one quarter of 1% of the overall trade book market here in the U.S. Um, 
2008 when we launched, ebooks accounted for about 1% of the overall market. Now, 2008 was a really important year. Around that time, Amazon launched with the Kindle Store. And with Amazon's marketing heft and market presence, they really helped accelerate the development of the ebook market in the United States. And so what you see here is just a rapid increase in market share for ebooks. We went from 1% to 3% to about 8% to 20%. And then in 2012, I would estimate that ebooks as a percentage of the overall book market represented about 30% of the market. Now this is based on, on overall dollar sales. One of the interesting things about this data, when you look at this chart here, is that it actually underestimates what's happening in the marketplace. Um, because ebooks are priced um, dramatically lower than print books, when we look at this market share increase, it's underestimating the number of books that are actually being read. And to, so that's what brings me to the next slide here. Um, what I've created here is, is um, you know, I call it an irresponsibly simplified macro representation of the future. So in this chart, um, I'm modeling the overall direction of the trend. Um, it's, it's less important to know where we're at in the trend than to know the direction that we're headed. And so here we are today, when we look at um, ebook market share, with ebooks around 30%, print books around 70%, it underestimates the unit share. If we were to measure the number of words being read on screens, the number of ebooks read on screens, the unit share is probably approaching 50%. I think if we're not there already, probably within the next 12 months, more words will be read through ebooks than read on paper. Now, this is a profound trend. And as an author, you want to position yourself for the future. And so you want to follow the eyeballs. This is where the eyeballs are going. Follow the unit numbers um, and position yourself there by making sure that um, all of your books and all of your words are available in the ebook format. At some point down the line, both unit share and dollar share, share for ebooks will exceed 50% of the overall uh, book market here in the US. So why are ebooks so hot? Well, the primary reason is that for many readers, um, reading on a screen is preferable to reading on paper. And one of the killer features of ebooks and e-reading devices is that you can click a button and instantly increase the font size. This makes reading more enjoyable more comfortable and more accessible to more readers than ever before. It's a great feature. Even for those of us that have 20-20 vision, it, it, it's great reading with larger, larger words. Now the other thing that's driving the market is consumer behavior. Um, there are really three primary motivators that drive consumer behavior for any product, and it's certainly true with books. Um, as book buyers, as consumers, um, we're attracted to things that offer us um, a lower price, greater convenience, and greater selection. Um, you might call it the Walmart effect. This is, what, this is how Walmart put Main Street America out of business, by offering lower costs, greater convenience, and greater selection. This is how Barnes & Noble and Borders put many independent booksellers out of business here in the United States. And it's how Amazon is now pressuring um, you know, all the major booksellers, including the independent booksellers, and, um, by offering lower prices, greater convenience, and greater selection. Obviously, Borders is no longer around today. They succumbed to um, market pressures. So th remember these, these consumer drivers. The second big trend is the democratization of publishing. 
Back in the dark ages of publishing, prior to five years ago, publishers controlled the printing press, they controlled the distribution to retailers, and they possessed all the knowledge necessary to publish a book professionally. And I, I see these three things as the essential legs to the tool. If you have the printing press, if you have the distribution, and if you have the knowledge necessary to professionally publish, if you if you know the best practices of professional publishing, then you can become a successful publisher. And in the past, you didn't have access to this unless you were selected by one of these big publishers. But the world has changed. Today, authors have complete access to all of these tools, and these tools are free. So now the, the printing press is available in the cloud, this is what we do at Smashwords. You can upload your book to us and we convert it into multiple ebook formats. Um, the distribution of ebooks is democratized. Um, starting back in 2009, um, Smashwords was the first to help open up distribution to retailers that previously were unable to take self published ebooks. So today, every major retailer ebook retailer in the world wants to carry self-published ebooks they don't care what the name of the publisher on the virtual spine is um, they care more about getting your books and your re and the readers care more about the author than the publisher so um, distribution is now democratized um, another thing that's available now is the knowledge of professional publishing best practices all of the knowledge necessary to become a professional publisher is now available to you for free. It's at your fingertips. You only need to make the effort to go find it. And it's one of the things that we do at Smashwords um, with some of the books I've written. I'll talk about those later. So publishers are losing their monopoly. Writers no longer need a publisher to publish, distribute, and sell their books. You know, in the dark ages of publishing, writers were forced to bow subservient to publishers. Writers looked to the publishers to um, grant them the title of author. And today that's no longer necessary. You have all the tools to become your own publisher. So writers are starting to ask two very dangerous questions. Now, dangerous if you're sitting in the shoes, standing in the shoes of a publisher. The first question is, what can a publisher do for me that I can't already do for myself? You can now produce, publish, distribute, and market your book on your own. You don't need a publisher. The second question, which is potentially even more dangerous, is that many writers are starting to realize that if they self-publish an ebook, they have competitive advantages over publishers. Authors are starting to realize that by self-publishing a book, they can do a better job of reaching readers than a publisher can. And on the flip side of that, they're starting to recognize that a publisher might actually harm their ability to reach readers because publishers tend to price the products too high. And there are many other reasons too that we'll talk about here. The third trend, self-published authors are hitting all the bestseller lists. If you go to any major ebook retailer today and look at their top 10 best-selling ebooks, you will see self-published ebooks on that list. Nearly every week, if you go to the New York Times bestseller list for ebooks, you will now see self published books on that list. Now, a year ago, that was almost unheard of. It was rare to see a self published author in the New York Times list. Now it's becoming common. We're starting to see um, all of the major ebook retailers um, increasing their merchandising focus on self published ebooks. Um, Apple um, and their with their iBooks store um, has been a real leader in this regard. Apple um, recognizes that 
self-published authors are writing excellent books, books that please Apple customers, and books that are priced dramatically lower than traditionally published books. This means Apple's able to offer a product that's value priced, that pleases the author, that's affordable to more customers, that helps them sell more books and satisfy and please more customers. That's all retailers care about is satisfying their customers and self-published authors with their books are doing that in a way that traditional publishers can't. So I'd like to make a prediction. I think within three years most New York Times best-selling ebooks will be from self-published authors. So you can check back with me in three years and tell me if I was correct or not. There's a decent chance that I'm being too conservative and it will probably happen faster than this. So let's talk about some of the advantages of, of indie authorship. And I'll, I'll point out that um, you'll, you'll hear me use the term self-published author and indie author. Indie means independent. Um, both terms are interchangeable. Indie author equals self-published author. So these are the advantages of indie ebook authorship. You have faster time to market. You can enjoy f faster time to market with your book. If your manuscript is completed today, you can upload it today. You can upload it to Smashwords today and your book will be for sale literally within five minutes and available for sale to a worldwide market. As an indie author, you enjoy total creative control. Let's say you wrote a book about paranormal blood-sucking blood vampire bunny rabbits. And you take it to a publisher and the publisher says, you know, we really like your book, but we already have three books on the fall schedule featuring paranormal blood-sucking vampire bunny rabbits. This happens all the time. That, that publishers, even if they like your book, they won't take it because they already have books that they think are similar to yours. Or they might think that a certain trend is no longer hot. Well, in my view, the publisher has no right to prevent you from publishing that book. If you believe in your book, you can publish it today. If you wrote a book that's 150,000 words and a publisher wants to tell you that that book should be 80,000 words, you can tell them to take a hike because for your story, 150,000 words meets the needs of your story and your reader. So this is one of the advantages of total creative control. As a self-published author, you can enjoy faster, better distribution to a global market. Uh, many of the traditional publishers um, and the agents who are serving them are still slicing and dicing ebook rights just as they do print rights. So they're selling rights into specific, to specific countries rather than selling global rights. And what this means is that there are these vast areas of geographic unavailability for your book. Your book might be available for sale in the UK and other Commonwealth countries, but not available in India. Or it might be available in one country, but not another. As a self-published author, you don't have to think about that. You can publish and distribute to a global market today. Back in the old world of print books, um, you would sell the rights to your book to a publisher 12 to 18 months later they would publish your book and distribute it to all the retailers. You would appear at, you know, hopefully thousands of different retailers. Um, but if your book didn't, does, didn't start selling through quickly, if it didn't start jumping off of shelves, those retailers would pack up your books and ship them back to the publisher for a full refund. This means that retailers were effectively forcing your book out of print before your book had a chance to reach readers. And that's that's really kind of a travesty if you think about it after spending years of, of your life, possibly your entire life, writing this book, to have it forced out of print so soon is really sad. With an ebook, your book is immortal. It will never go out of print. You always have another day to sell the book. You always have another day to iterate your book, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So even if you're not a bestseller on day one, you might, be a best, you might become a bestseller next year.
we've had multiple Smashwords authors who've had books out for years before they started taking off in the charts. As a self-published author, you enjoy lower expenses than the traditionally published authors. You're working out of your house. The publishers are working out of Manhattan Skyrise offices. They have a lot of rent to pay. They have a lot of employees to pay. They need to charge higher prices for their books. But as a self-published author with lower expenses, you can charge lower prices for your books. This gives you a competitive advantage, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. You can also earn more per book. Quadruple plus, I want you to remember that. As a self-published ebook author, you're going to earn 60 to 80 percent of the list price as your royalty. Now, traditionally published ebook authors only earn 12 to 17 percent. So, as an indie author, you're going to earn four to five times more. And if you're if you're an indie author selling your book off of your own website, you're going to earn 100 percent. So let's let's examine what these numbers mean. It means as an indie author, you can price your book at two dollars and ninety nine cents, and you're going to earn about two dollars for every book that you sell. A traditionally published author um, would have to have their book priced over ten dollars to earn two dollars. So what are readers going to choose? If they have the choice between two books of equal quality and one is twelve ninety nine and the other is two ninety nine, what are they going to buy? They're going to buy the lower cost book. This is why indie authors have such a tremendous advantage in the marketplace. Anytime you're able to lower the price of your product, it makes your product more affordable, more available, more accessible to more customers around the world. And you've got the benefit that's kind of like a virtual virtuous flywheel here where because it's a lower price you're able to um, increase the demand sell more units and you're selling more units at a higher profit per unit than you could if you were traditionally published so these underlying fundamental economics of ebook publishing are really helping to drive um, the, the tremendous growth in self-publishing many many authors are now choosing to self-publish rather than traditionally publish for this reason. And it helps you understand how authors who are choosing to traditionally publish face a disadvantage in the ebook space. Traditionally published authors still enjoy um, benefits that aren't available to self-published authors such as um, having access to brick and mortar bookstore distribution for their print books. But as ebooks as a as the as as ebooks as a percentage of the overall book market increase and print books decrease, that advantage is going to de decrease. The fourth trend: the stigma of self-publishing is disappearing. Five years ago, when we launched Smashwords, um, self-publishing was seen as the option of last resort for writers. It was seen as the option for failed writers, writers who couldn't get a publishing deal. But now it's increasingly viewed as the option of first choice. So here's the, the second of my um, irresponsibly simplified macro representations of the future. I've created some lines here that show the general trend in the stigmas. So five years ago, 99.9% of all writers aspired um, for that traditional publishing deal. No, Virtually no writers aspired to self-publish. But that's changing. Many of those writers who were forced to self-publish out of necessity achieved great commercial success. And their success helped inspire the next generation of writers. The first wave of professional writers to enter self-publishing was really uh, the romance writers. So back in 2008, 2009 at Smashwords, we saw a wave of romance titles coming from traditionally published romance authors who had written a lot of books, and those books were now out of print. And the publishers uh, had reverted the rights back 
to the author. So the publisher was basically saying, we got all the value out of this book that we can or that we could, and this, these books are no longer valuable to us, so here you can have your rights back. And so these romance authors were bringing their books back to life as self-published ebooks. And what they started discovering is that they started earning more money with their low-priced self-published ebooks than they had earned during their entire publishing contract with the traditional publishers. So this set the example for writers and all the other genres. Um, so I, you know, I give a lot of credit to the romance authors for helping to pioneer um, a lot of this in the early days. So today we're probably along here on my chart. Um, I think most writers still aspire to traditionally publish, but a decreasing number and an increasing number are aspiring to self-publish. We're seeing, seeing an increasing number of writers who no longer bother shopping their book around to agents and publishers. They're publishing directly to their readers using Smashwords and Amazon and other platforms to, to um, reach their readers faster. I think in the next few years we're going to see the stigmas flip because at the same time that the stigma of self-publishing self is disappearing, the stigma of traditional publishing is increasing. So probably within three years, maybe four years, more writers will aspire to self-publish than will aspire to traditionally publish. I've already heard stories of professional writers, traditionally published writers sitting around a table where you've got a mix of traditional authors and self-published authors and authors who've done both and a writer raises their hand and says I just got a publishing deal with New York and the other writers around the table say oh I'm so sorry. This conversation has happened um, I heard that story from one of the world's best-selling self-published ebook authors, and I think we're going to see that story repeated over and over again. I've spoken with so many Smashwords writers who tell me that they're never going to publish with New York again, or if they publish with New York again, um, the publishers are going to have to throw a lot of money at them, because these writers are enjoying self-publishing. They're enjoying the creative control, they're enjoying the economic benefits, and they're just enjoying the process of self-publishing their books and publishing directly to their readers and having direct contact with their readers. Fifth trend, ebooks are going global. A lot of writers, when they're writing their book and publishing their book, they're thinking primarily of the U.S. market. The U.S. market is the world's largest market for books. Um, but for those of you listening, I want you to think outside the U.S. I think the global market um, in the next few years is going to become much more important than the U.S. market. And I'm talking for English language books here. Most of the major ebook retailers are expanding globally very quickly. Um, Apple is now in 51 countries around the world. Amazon's in over a dozen. Kobo's in over a dozen. Barnes & Noble last year in 2012 expanded into the UK and they're talking about expanding into other European countries. So all you have to do is get your books to these retailers and then as they expand you'll be able to enjoy the, 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 the broadened distribution. Now at Smashwords as an ebook distributor we distribute books to all of these 51 countries that Apple serves. Already, 45% of our sales through Apple are outside the United States. And I should point out that, you know, if you think back to the chart that I showed you, how the market in the U.S. has grown exponentially, um, the rest of the world is still two, three, four, sometimes in some instances five years behind the U.S. in terms of adopting ebooks. The rest of the world is now just entering that rapid phase of that exponential growth cycle. So I think over the next couple of years um, it's going to be really interesting to see how 
the global market develops and how important the global market becomes um, to your career as an author. So um, that's the five trends. Now let's um, talk about how to publish and distribute an ebook. I'm going to share with you um, a checklist of ebook publishing and um, we'll talk about the terminology. I'll define the terminology as, as, as we um, approach each term and I'll show you just how easy it is to publish a book and hopefully I'll also help demystify some of these terms that might be causing you some confusion. So the first step in publishing a book is to write a super awesome book. Now, ebook publishing tools like Smashwords make it fast, free, and easy for you to publish a book. But if I had a single criticism for Smashwords, I would say that we make it too easy for writers to self-publish a book. We make it too easy for you to publish a book that's not yet ready for prime time. You need to remember that as a self-published author, you are the publisher. It's your responsibility to take on um, all of the responsibilities that traditionally that traditional publishers take on. So it's your job to make sure that before your book goes out the door, that it's professionally edited, that it's been proofread, that you've revised it multiple times, that it's really solid, that it has a professional cover on it, um, and all that. Because readers have very little tolerance for shoddy work. If you fail to serve the readers, then your book is not going to get read. And I want you to be successful. I want you to be as successful as you can be. Um, and you can be successful if you approach this with professionalism. So, um, you know, borrow, borrow some pages from traditional publishers and identify what they do really well and then do it yourself. And if you're not clear on what they do well um, and what you can do well, um, you know, continue with this presentation and also check out some of my books, which I'll talk about later, which are all free and um, will tell you more about those professional best practices that are necessary um, to reach readers. Ebook formatting. Now, you may have heard this term, ebook formatting. The term might scare you. Um, it's not too scary. Um, formatting is the process of laying out and designing your book so that it's ready for ebook publication and ebook conversion. If you're publishing a book with Smashwords, you're going to want to download the Smashwords style guide. Um, this is probably the world's most read ebook formatting book. Um, we've, it's been downloaded over 300,000 times. It's free and we show you just how easy it is to uh, format a book. All you need is a word processor. So I'll share with you a couple formatting secrets. If you have any experience whatsoever in print publishing, I want you to forget some of what you know. When you're formatting a book for ebooks, the goal is not to make your ebook look like a print book. If you think about it, print books, print is a fixed format. If you're if you're laying out a book for print, you control the font size, you control where every letter appears on the page. With ebooks, you don't have that control because ebooks are reflowable ebooks feature reflowable text. What I mean by that is that the reader can push a button and the font size will increase and suddenly that book goes from being 200 pages on the e-reading device to 300 pages. So you want to design your words, design your formatting so that the words can shape shift across all of these different screen sizes. You also want to design your book. Um, w when you design your book for reflowability, you're also designing the book to be more easily customized by the readers. I'll give you an example here. So this is um, this is a book from a Smashwords author um, as it's shown on a on an iPhone screen. 
And you can see that if the phone is held in portrait mode, that the words look like that. And if it's held in landscape mode, the words reflow and the book repaginates across all, this, all the pages. You can also see that in this e-reading app, the user chose this um, dark violet color, a stone carving background on the background. Now, for anyone with professional print layout experience, what the reader did to this book here is an abomination. I mean, what professional publisher would publish a book with, with violet, purpley text? Just about no publisher in the world would do that. But by giving up, by seeding some of this control to the reader, by giving the reader the ability to customize the reading experience how they like, you're actually adding value to the book for them. And this is one of the, the benefits in reflowable books. The reader can customize the reading experience to, to match their preferences. Let's talk about cover images. Now with a print book, you're going to have a front cover, a back cover, and a spine. Those are three different images for a print book. With an ebook, you only need one image, and that's the cover image. Now, cover images are extremely important. Next to the quality of your book, the quality of your words and your story, the ebook cover is the next most important thing. Your ebook cover is the first impression that you're going to make on the prospective reader. Uh, the retailer will use your cover to merchandise your book on their site. Think about how readers browse through a bookstore, whether it's a physical bookstore or even an online bookstore. They look at the cover. If the cover grabs them, they pick it up, they sample it, they look at it, they put it back down. In online stores, readers are browsing through the covers and they've got a filter that they're applying in their head. It's not conscious that readers are doing this, but they're looking to avoid books that don't interest them and find books that do. And so the cover is the, is, is the first hurdle that you need to overcome. You need to attract the reader. You need to make them click on your book um, just based on the cover. Um, it's really important to make the cover image engaging and you need to match it to your target audience. Um, as, a, as an author, you need to understand who your target audience is. That's um, a really important thing for you to understand so that you can design a cover that matches the, the desires of your target audience. Um, the cover image needs to be professional. Um, if you try to design the cover on your own and you're not a professional cover designer, it's going to show and you're going to chase away readers. Uh, you want your cover to look good as a thumbnail image. Um, whereas a a book in a bookstore appears in its full physical size. Um, in an online bookstore, it's your, your book is going to be reduced to the size of a postage stamp. And so you need your cover and your image to convey well at that size. You also want the cover image to display well in black and white and in grayscale, because not all e-reading devices are color devices. So first question is, should you design the cover on your own or should, should you hire a professional? Um, I would suggest that you hire a professional. It's probably the cheapest investment that you can make in your book. Um, high quality cover designers um, are available for 50 or $150. At Smashwords, we maintain a list. It's called Mark's List. Um, you can send an email to list at smashwords.com and you'll receive an email via instant autoresponder with a list of low-cost cover designers. So like I, as I mentioned, most of them are between $50 and $150 and they all have online portfolios. And if you don't like their work, there are many, many other cover designers out there on the web and most of them are priced under $300 and even $300 in my opinion, is ridiculously cheap um, if you can get a cover 
that, that looks really great. You want your cover to look as good or better than what the big New York publishers are putting out. Now, um, most of us design terrible covers. So about a year ago, I wrote a, a short ebook titled The 10 Minute PR Checklist. And I thought, okay, well, cover design should be pretty easy, so I'll design my own cover. And this is what I designed. And it is an abomination. It's an embarrassment. But this is the best I could do because I'm not a graphic artist. So next I contacted um, one of the designers on our list. And I sent, I sent the designer an email. I've, I've never even spoken with her. I just sent her an email and I said, look, I've got this idea for a cover. I want to see, you know, a guy holding a megaphone because this book is about PR and I want to see some spotlights on him. And um, I I want to see a little award sticker. Or I, like, I want it to look like an award sticker. Not that this book has won any awards. But I wanted to call out something special. And so I put in here, you know, I told her I wanted this award sticker. And I wanted it to say a 20-year PR veteran shares his secrets. And that's all I told her. And the next day... I got this cover back. This is her first draft. It cost me $45, and I was blown away. I mean, isn't this so much better than that? And only $45. So that's what I went with. Now, when we're talking about best practices, it's helpful to also look at worst practices. This here is a book at Smashwords. I'm not going to mention the title. Um, now, I don't know what this book is about, just looking at the cover image. It looks like a beautiful picture of sand. How is the reader going to determine if this book is for them? Unless maybe they've got a desire for sand, or a book about sand, um, this book is not going to appeal to them. Now, the book is not about sand. The book is about Dominique Strauss-Kahn. Now, would you guess that from this cover image? There's a reason that this book has not sold a single copy at Smashwords. That's a horrible cover. Covers, good covers make a promise. This, I, I like this cover image, and it's a pretty simple cover image. But just simply looking at the image. You can ignore the title and the author name. You look at the image, you know what you're going to get from this book. You're going to get love, intimacy, passion. This is a romance book. So a good cover makes, makes, a, makes an emotional promise to the reader. Put yourself in the reader's shoes. The reader is looking for their next read. They're looking for their next read, usually um, in some specific genre, whether it's a thriller, a horror novel, or a romance novel. And readers of those different types of novels are looking for a different reading experience. They're looking for a different emotional experience. And so a great cover promises that experience. And a great cover is going to honestly, deli it's going to honestly promise an experience that the book delivers. Um, this is another romance um, cover um, from Bella Andre. Bella Andre is one of the world's best-selling self-published authors. She also has some books that are traditionally published. She originally came from the traditional publishing world um, and now she's one of the biggest advocates for self-publishing. I love Bella Andre's covers. So, you know, when you get off of this video, go Google um, her covers, go Google her name or go to any of the major retailers and look at her covers. She does a fantastic job on her covers. I love that the image is so prominent. I love that it makes an appropriate promise to the target reader. I love that her name is so large. Now, when you put your name on your cover image and you make it large, you're you're sending the reader a message that you're a big name.
because why else would your name be so large on the cover? Your name deserves to be large because you're a big author. And if the reader doesn't know your name, well, why don't they know your name? They should know your name because you're a big author. Um, so that's the little mental mind game that you're playing here with a large, um, with a with your name large on the cover. Um, and the reason this works is because the author is the brand. The reader doesn't care about the publisher. The reader cares about the author. The reader cares if if you are a brand, if you are an author name that they know and that they trust, if they've read your work before, did it satisfy them? Because if it satisfied them before, they're going to want to be, they're, they will be more likely to want to read your books in the future. So this is a great cover. I really like it. Um, here's another cover that I really like. Um, this this book is by Jack Kilborn. It's a pen name for Joe Conrath, another um, you know outspoken advocate for um, self-publishing and someone who comes from both worlds. He's been traditionally published and now he's self-published. Um, this is a horror novel, and you could strip away the title and the author name and simply look at the image. If you are a horror fan and you're looking to be scared. That's a scary image. I mean, it looks like it's got this misty blood coming out of his mouth and fangs, and he's angry, and I just look at that and I'm scared. If I'm looking to be scared, this is the book for me. So this, I, that's why I really like this image, because it makes that promise to me if I'm looking for that type of book. Okay, so now I'm going to um, share a case study of... Um, of a, an author at Smashwords. This is R.L. Mathewson. She is an awesome author. She writes great books. She gets five-star reviews on her books. She's got a huge fan following. Um, and what we're looking at here is a very early cover that she introduced early in her self-publishing career. And um, as you can see, it's a pretty simple cover. And a lot of authors will do this. They'll just simply type the text of their book on a blank colored image. Um, it's obviously not a very good cover. Um, it doesn't tell the reader that this is a romance book. It doesn't convey a promise. So one of the neat things about ebooks is that, you know, I talked earlier about how your book is immortal. Well, with an ebook, a self published ebook, you can change your book over time. You can evolve it over time. So RL realized that this was not a good cover and so she upgraded the cover. And when you're working with a distributor like Smashwords, if you want to upgrade your cover, you just upload a new cover image and then we transfer, we send that cover out um, to all the bookstores that we're serving. So it's really easy to update your cover or, or update anything about your book. So this is the second version of the cover that she did. Now you can see that it's certainly a lot better than the previous version, but it's still not making the appropriate promise. And um, RL realized that, she realized that on her own, and um, upgraded the cover again to this. Now this cover makes a promise. If you're a romance reader, you know what you're going to get from this book because she's making a very clear promise to you. And it's interesting how in this cover image, you know, most New York publishers wouldn't publish a book that looked like this, where it was all image and the words are kind of down here in small type. When this image is condensed down to a thumbnail, the title and the author name become invisible. But this is a marked improvement over the previous covers. Now I'm going to show you what happened after she changed to this cover. This is how her book was performing at the Apple iBookstore. This is the number of units that she was selling every day. You could see that she was selling 5, 10, 
copies a day, maybe a little less, but she was selling copies every single day, and she was selling copies with that co with that cover there. When she updated the cover at Smashwords, we delivered it to Apple um, within a day or two on this day here. You can see what happened to her sales. They imme immediately took off. I noticed this. Um, I noticed uh, about this point on the on the spike. I noticed that her her book had suddenly um, taken off in, uh, among our best sellers at Apple. And so I wrote her an email and I said, hey, you know, hi. Um, I see your book is really breaking out at Apple. What did you do? And she um, she wrote me back, but and she said that you know she simply changed the cover image. So that's pretty amazing. Um, what that tells me is that this the previous image here was not making an, making an appropriate promise. It was creating unnecessary friction that was preventing readers from taking a chance on her book. But even with that cover, she was still reaching readers and she was still getting great five-star reviews. So she wrote a super awesome book, which is the most difficult thing in the world to do. Um, but, it, but the cover was holding her back until she, uh, she, until she updated her cover and it just unleashed the book and it took off. Around the same time, um, Apple's merchandising manager sent me an email and said, hey, this book is really taking off. Do you know what happened? And I said, well, actually, they just changed the cover. Um, so you see the, it spiked here and then it dropped. This is pretty normal um, for a book. So at about this point, she was probably you know, in the top 10 bestsellers in the romance genre. But then the book started picking up steam again. This is all organic growth. This is all driven by reader word of mouth. And this only happens if you've written a super great book that's getting great reviews and generating reader word of mouth. This is readers finishing the book and telling their friends to go out and buy it. So Apple was so sufficiently impressed with how this book was performing that they decided to promote it on the site. And that caused it to go um, up into the top five bestsellers. So for a couple days, she was selling over 2,000 copies a day. Um, and this sales spike happened not just at Apple, but all the other retailers. And it landed her on the New York Times bestseller list for a book that had been on the market for months. It just simply needed a new cover. So I love this example of what R.L. Mathewson did and how a new cover helped helped the book realize its full potential. And um, I know that R.L. now is working on doing another revision of the covers to make them even more professional. Um, so it, it, she's, she's a great role model. Um, and, you know, there are many, many, many other self-published authors who are following the same journey of constantly improving their books, tweaking things until they get the formula right. So let's talk about a term called metadata. You may have heard this term. You may not know what the term means. Um, let's explain what it is. So metadata is information about your book. Metadata enables discovery. It, it makes it possible for readers to discover your books. Um, some, of the meta, some of the metadata you're going to create and some is automatically generated by the retailers. So let's look at some examples of metadata. Your price is metadata. So here's your book and you've got all these things attached to your book, all the metadata data about your book. So the price, the book title, the book category, the language, the ISBN, publication date, any tags, your book description, your author name. So all of these things are metadata. When you publish your book at Smashwords on that upload page, we're going to ask you your price, your book title, your author name, all of this information. Um, we're going to capture this metadata. We're going to share this metadata with the retailers, and the retailers are going to use this metadata to make your book discoverable to readers. The book category, for example, will tell the reader what virtual shelf to place your book in. 
All right, so now let's um, let's talk about ebook conversion. So you've completed your book; it's fully edited. You've got a professional cover on it. Uh, you've adorned it with wonderful metadata. Now you're going to upload your book and get it converted into an ebook at Smashwords. So let's talk about what that is. So conversion is the process of turning your formatted manuscript into an ebook file. And an ebook file is a file that's readable on um, any of the different ebook reading devices. So a Kindle, an iPad, an iPhone, a Barnes and Noble Nook, a Sony Reader, a Kobo Reader, uh, a personal computer, you name your screen, you want your book readable on that screen. And again, here are some of the screens that we're talking about. Um, so here are some of your different options for conversion. At Smashwords, we use an automated system, and it's it's so, it's somewhat similar to what Amazon does and Barnes and Noble and some others, um, where you upload your masterpiece as a Microsoft Word document. It goes into our conversion system, which we call Meek Grinder, and Meek Grinder um, converts your book into all of these different formats. So it converts it into the EPUB format. Now EPUB is an open industry standard format. It's used by every major ebook reading device maker except for Amazon. Um, PDF is a format that we're all familiar with. Mobi is a format um, that makes your book readable on the Kindle. And there are various other formats. Now if your book is mostly narrative, or narrative plus some images. So we're talking most fiction, most uh, memoirs. Um, the automated approach to ebook conversion works really well for you. If you're publishing a book that has more complex formatting, maybe it's a book with lots of charts and graphs and tables and sophisticated indentation and numbered lists and things like that. Um, you might want to um, use an ebook um, design and conversion tool like Caliber, Sigil, or um, even Adobe InDesign. And then you'll, th this requires a little more technical expertise, but you'll be able to go in there and hand code the book and customize it so that it looks just right. And then you can upload the book to Smashwords when you're done as an EPUB file. If you've written a book that is even more complicated than you can do on your own. There are, you know, ebook formatters and designers, programmers that you can hire to do, to uh, to do that for you. Now, obviously, the automated option is completely free. It doesn't cost you anything. It just takes you, um, you know, a couple hours to learn the formatting rules by reading the style guide. Um, and these do-it-yourself conversion tools that Caliber, Sigil are free. Um, Adobe InDesign obviously costs money. I would encourage you to try the automated method first because it works really well for about 95% of the books that are out there. This option here can be pretty expensive, the last option. Pricing. Authors often ask me, how should I price my book? Well, my, my first answer is that it really depends on your objective. What are you trying to achieve with your book? Um, you know, writers often write books for reasons that are different than publishers publish books. Publishers are, are publishing books to make money and to sell, sell books. But some writers aren't interested in making money, they just want to reach readers. So for those authors, if it's more important for you to get your message out than it is to make money, then the best price is free, because free Free will get you close to 100 times more downloads than a book at any price, based on our, our, our research. But most authors don't fall into that camp. Most authors want to reach a lot of readers, but they also want to earn some well-deserved money from all their hard work. So if you're, pricing, if you're publishing multiple books, and I encourage you to pu publish multiple books, because the more books you publish, the more you're going to sell, um, use multiple price points. So make sure your books are covering multiple price points because there are different different groups of readers that that flock to certain prices. There are some readers who will only 
download free books if they don't know who you are. If they don't yet know and trust your author brand, then they'll only take a chance on you if your book is free. That describes some segment of the audience. And if they like your book, then they'll go on and purchase your books that have a price. So it's not that the, 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 the people who are looking for freebies are looking to freeload, but they just require that your book is free before they take a chance and pay money on your other books. Um, some readers are looking for books at 99 cents, some at these other price points. There are some readers who refuse to buy books that are priced under $3.99 or $2.99 or $4.99 or $5.99 or whatever. There's a segment, this, I've spoken with some of these readers and I've spoken with a lot of authors who've experienced these readers. Um, there is a segment of customers out there who will not buy cheap books because they are assuming that if the book is priced too low that it's not a quality book. So that's really interesting. Um, it says that readers value their time more than they value their money. I've heard multiple instances where an author raised the price of their book from $2.99 to $3.99 and they sold more copies. Now this is not a universal truth. It doesn't apply to the entire reading public. Uh, you should really imagine readers being as diverse as humanity is diverse. So readers are going to fall into different camps of what they're interested in, which is why you should try to touch multiple price points with your books. Uh, if you write nonfiction, um, nonfiction generally can support a higher price than fiction. You know, for fiction, the the best price points are usually two ninety nine, three ninety nine, four ninety nine, or free. Um, for nonfiction, you can go a little bit higher. And the reason you can go a little bit higher is that with nonfiction, readers are typically looking for knowledge or for information that will help them solve a problem or help them. Um, create something or do something and that something has value to the reader and as long as the perceived value the perceived benefit of your knowledge that you're going to share with them exceeds the price of your book then it's a no-brainer for the reader to pay a higher price we had an author a couple years ago who uploaded some books priced at $75 now when I first saw these books I thought okay this guy's crazy no one's gonna pay $75 for a digital file that costs nothing to reproduce. I mean, there's no paper, there's no binding, there's no glue, there's no oil to transport that book around to bookstores. Um, yet this guy earned thousands of dollars within a couple months. And the reason was that he was writing high value content. He had a, a, a nationally recognized platform. Um, it, he was offering investment advice and stock picks. And for someone, you know, for investors who you know, routinely invest tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the stock market, paying $75 for a great stock pick is not a high price to pay. So um, you, you can do that if you're, if you're publishing high value content. All right, now let's talk about ISBNs. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding out there about ISBN. So I'll, I'll try to demystify them for you. So let's talk about first what is an ISBN. Well, for, first and foremost, it is a unique digital identifier. This is an ISBN right here. It's a 13-digit number, and it helps those of us in the supply chain, meaning book distributors, retailers, helps us keep track of your book. It helps us communicate about your book. It, it, if we're going to t tell our retailer to increase the price of the book because you want the price increased, we're not going to say increase the price of Jane's memoir. We're going to say increase the price of this identifier. So at Smashwords, um, ISBNs are required if you want your book distributed to Apple, Sony, Kobo, and you know some of the other retailers that we serve. Um, ISBNs are a great idea. You should have an ISBN on your book. There's really no reason not to. 
Um, let's talk about, though, what an ISBN is not. An ISBN has no bearing whatsoever on the ownership of your book or the copyright of your book. It just doesn't matter. Um, if your book has an ISBN, it doesn't mean that your book is more professional or more real. There are some authors out there who spend a lot of time looking at some of these numbers and trying to discern, um, you know, is this a book published by a large publisher or a small publisher or a self-published author? Readers don't do that. Readers are not going to look at your ISBN and try to make judgments about your book. ISBNs are not a common discovery method for readers. Your readers are not going to go to Google and type in your ISBN to find your book. It's just not going to happen. So where can you get an ISBN? Um, if you're in the, in the United States, you go to Bowker.com. Um, you can buy them, you can buy a single ISBN, I think it's about $125, which is pretty expensive. Um, or you can buy them in blocks of 10 and, um, and get, them, get the per unit cost lower. When you buy an ISBN direct from Bowker, um, you will be listed as the publisher in their books in print database. Now, there's not a lot of value to being listed in their books in print database. Um, Many authors have told me that the moment they're listed in that database, they start getting solicitations in the mail from people trying to sell them stuff. Um, readers do not use books in print to discover books. Um, but maybe some institutions, some libraries might. Um, if it's important to you that the book is in your name as the publisher, you can go to Bowker and get your ISBN. At Smashwords, we really don't care how you get your ISBN as long as it's your ISBN and it's unique. Um, it's very important that the ISBN that you choose for your ebook has never been used anywhere else. You can't use a, a, an ISBN that you're already using for a print book on your ebook. Or if you're publishing a print book like a CreateSpace or one of the other um, self publishing services, you can't, you can't reuse that, that ISBN somewhere else. On an ebook. Now, your second option for getting an ISBN is to get it at Smashwords, and at Smashwords we offer ISBNs for free. So I think free is a great price. Um, we buy them in bulk. We buy them 50,000 ISBNs at a time, and uh, you can do the same. Um, and get, well, you can take advantage of the low pricing and get them for free. That's how we're able to offer them for free. Copyright. Um, copy, any, any time that you publish something, any time you upload something to Smashwords, you have some measure of copyright protection. Copyright gives you the right to enjoy an exclusive bundle of rights that come with that book. Um, we've all seen this, um, this circle C copyright symbol. It's completely optional if you want to include that symbol inside your book or not. Um, you know, I, I think it looks nice, but it's completely unnecessary. If you want the best um, legal protection, if you want the ability to sue a, another party if they violate your copyright, then you can go to copyright.gov and um, pay $35 and register your copyright formally with the U.S. government. And that'll give you the right to sue somebody. Most authors don't do this, um, but if it gives you peace of mind, go ahead. Uh, if you want to learn more about copyright, uh, I would encourage you to go to the Copyright Clearance Center at copyright.com. This is a private company. Um, it's not run by the U.S. government, but they've got um, a lot of helpful videos about copyright, so you can learn more about copyright for free. page down. All right. Distribution to retailers. Once you've produced and published your book, you want your book at retailers. Um, here's a, a really a short summary of some of the major retailers around the world who 
want to carry self-published ebooks. All the retailers want self-published ebooks. So we've got Apple, Sony, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Diesel, Smashwords. Even though our primary business is ebook distribution, we also operate an ebook retailer. Amazon, you know, the world's largest retailer of ebooks, um, and some others. Um, it's really important that you maximize the availability of your books and avoid exclusivity. Ebook retailing is not like sports, religion, or politics. In sports, religion, and politics, you typically choose a single team and you just play for that one team. Not so with retailing. You want your book everywhere. All of these retailers are investing millions of dollars to build and develop their platforms and to attract readers to your books. So take advantage of that by making your books available at all of them. Um, if your book isn't available at every retailer, it means it's not discoverable or purchasable to readers that shop exclusively at that retailer. For example, if your book is not at the Apple I bookstore, you're missing out on millions of book buyers who only shop at the Apple iBook store. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to avoid any form of exclusivity. Um, Amazon, for example, um, tries to encourage um, authors to join their exclusive program called KDP Select. I wouldn't do that. Um, anytime you make your book exclusive to a single retailer, you risk angering your fans fans who would prefer to buy your book elsewhere, um, you limit your audience. Because a lot of book discovery is serendipitous and by accident. If you are not at every retailer, then fewer readers are going to stumble across your books. Also, if you make your books exclusive to any single retailer, whether it's Amazon or Apple or Barnes & Noble or anyone, um, you're increasing your dependence upon that single retailer. If you're getting all of your sales from a single retailer, then you are vulnerable. You're not, you're not properly diversified. Just as an investment advisor would tell you, don't invest all your money in a single stock, don't invest your book's future and your future as an author in a, just a single retailer. Um, spread, spread the love around and work with as many retailers as you can. You have um, two options for getting your books out to retailers. Um, one option is to use a distributor. Now, Smashwords is a distributor, so obviously I'm partial to this option. Um, but I'll, I'll try to give you um, a little bit of information about both of the different options. With a distributor, you're going to upload one file, one cover image, to that distributor. And the distributor is going to send that book. They're going to prepare that book and prepare all your metadata so that it meets all the requirements of all the different retailers they're serving. So you upload one book, they send it out to many retailers. Um, and they're sending it out to many retailers that you can't reach on your own. Um, when you're working with a distributor, you have centralized metadata management. This means you can manage your books across multiple channels from a single dashboard. So for example, at Smashwords, from the Smashwords dashboard, if you want to change the price of your book, you change it once at Smashwords, and then we broadcast that change out to all the retailers that we serve. If you want to change the cover image, if you want to fix a typo in your book, if you want to update your book description, if you want to change the title of your book, you do that once at Smashwords, we send it out. So a big benefit of working with a distributor is the time savings. You can spend more time writing and less time fussing with all the different retailers. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the year, you get consolidated tax reporting. So this is a big time saver. So rather than having to collect tax forms from multiple retailers, you collect one tax form from Smashwords. Um, we also, when we pay you quarterly, um, you can enjoy the consolidated, tax re consolidated um, sales reporting, consolidated payments. It just simplifies a lot of things for you. Um, Distributors can also offer you more advanced, sophisticated merchandising features that you may not be able to get on your own. So at Smashwords recently, we launched 
um, we announced pre-orders. We're doing pre we can now distribute pre-order books to Apple, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo. As a self-published author, if you want to do a pre-order at Barnes and Noble, you can't do it any other way than working with a distributor today. So th those are some of the benefits of using a distributor. Um, the other option to get your books to retailers is to upload your book directly to some of the retailers who will support it. So Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, um, all allow you to upload your book directly to them if you want to go to that trouble. And, you know, I say trouble, but it's not that difficult. It just takes time. Um, but it means that you have to manage each of the retailers separately. It means if you want to update your price, you have to go to each retailer and separately, you know, log in and change the price and then wait for the price to change. As opposed to with a distributor where you can centrally manage all that. Um, and there are certain retailers that you just simply can't upload direct to. So Sony, Diesel, uh, Flipkart, which is um, the largest retailer in India, um, libraries, all, all of these other retail outlets um, require you to work with a distributor. Um, now there's there's really a third option that I didn't list here and that's to use a distributor and go direct to some retailers. So if you would prefer to upload direct to Amazon you can do that and then you can use Smashwords to distribute to the other major retailers. That's actually what most of our authors do because we don't yet have an automated um, distribution system set up with Amazon. So most of our authors upload direct there and then use us for the other retailers. But that's totally up to you. Um, at Smashwords you can opt in and opt out of different distribution channels as you please. Piracy. Piracy is a fun one. I know a lot of writers when they're first entering um, ebook publishing are concerned about piracy. They're concerned that someone's going to make illegal copies of their books and that their books are going to be read uh, without being paid for. So let's talk about piracy. The first thing I want you to know about piracy is that you should not worry about it. The biggest risk you're facing as an author is obscurity, being unknown. And even if you are already a New York Times best-selling author, you are still obscure. You can hit the New York Times bestseller list selling 30, 40, 50,000 copies of a book, but there are still hundreds of millions of readers that who don't know who you are, so you're still obscure to them. So don't worry about piracy. And these, these black hat pirates, these evil demons who lurk on these underground pirate bulletin boards and file sharing sites who are who go out of their way to find the books they want for free these people wouldn't have purchased your book anyway so it's not like you're losing any money to these pirates if your book wasn't available on the pirate site they wouldn't be reading your book and they wouldn't be buying your book now the reality of the matter is that most piracy, most illegal file sharing, is really accidental. It's that enthusiastic fan who reads your book, they love your book, and they want all of their friends and family to read the book too. Now this is going to happen, you can't prevent it from happening. It already happens in the print world. You go to a bookstore, you buy a print book, you love it, you pass it on to someone. So this happens in the ebook world. Even though it's not legal, even though, you know, at Smashwords, we um, strongly encourage customers not to share these books, um, it will happen. But if it does happen, I want you to see it as the lowest cost form of marketing that you'll ever experience and the most effective form of marketing. So don't worry about that. <clears throat> now the only reliable method of preventing piracy is to never publish your book. You know when when JK Rowling's um, Harry Potter series came out in print you know for many years it was only available in print 
um, every time the, a new edition came out, within hours, it was pirated and available online as an ebook. So you just you can't prevent it. Um, Anti-piracy measures such as copy protection, commonly referred to as DRM, um, are are potentially counterproductive because these copy protection schemes punish law-abiding customers by making it difficult for them to enjoy your book on multiple devices. So DRM is like selling a paperback book and saying you can only read it in bed but you can't read it on the beach. You know at Smashwords when we sell a book in the Smashwords store the customer pays one price and they're able to access the book in multiple formats. So if today they're reading books on a Kindle but two years from now they move to the iPad um, they still have access to your book in, and the different formats necessary for these different devices. I think that's the way it should be. I think that's more reader friendly, more customer friendly. You don't want to create unnecessary friction that gets in the way of your fans enjoying your book. Now um, there are some things that you can do to reduce the incidence of piracy. Uh, the first thing that you can do is make sure that your book is broadly distributed to as many retailers as possible so that it's easier to purchase your book than it is to seek out an illegal copy of it. And price the book low and at a fair price. So I'm talking $2.99, $3.99, $4.99. Make it affordable. Most of the piracy that happens in the world, I think, is a result of authors and publishers creating demand for their books but not fulfilling that demand. Um, I know this affects traditional publishers all the time. Their marketing campaigns um, are generating online word of mouth on Facebook and Twitter and everywhere else and people in countries where the book's not available are learning about the book and wanting to read the book yet the book isn't distributed to their geography so of course they're going to try to find a copy however they can. Um, so as long as you make your book widely available, globally available, and price it so it's affordable and not overpriced, um, most readers are going to choose to buy a legal authorized copy. Let's talk about marketing. Most writers that I meet would rather spend all their time writing than spending their time marketing. Marketing is a really scary idea for a lot of writers. A lot of writers misunderstand marketing as well. Um, I want you to know that marketing is not as important as some people say it is. And I say that as someone who came from the marketing world, um, someone who believes in the power of marketing, but who also understands um, the challenges of doing marketing right. I, I want you to see marketing as a catalyst, but it's not a fuel. I mean, think about, like, if you want to barbecue hamburgers, lighter fluid is a catalyst. If you want to pour lighter fluid on rocks, you can broil some hamburgers, but that's not the best way to do it. It's better to put lighter fluid on charcoal. The charcoal is the, is the ultimate fuel. Um, book marketing is kind of the same way. Your book is the fuel. Your book is the best marketing that you can do. Reader word of mouth is going to determine your success as an author. So the best marketing you can do is write a super awesome book. Um, focus on things that bring permanence to your effort of reaching readers. Focus on things that make your book more discoverable to readers. Um, focus on building your platform, which is your ability to reach readers. Those things are going to be much more effective than spending money on advertising, for example. Advertising tends to be ephemeral, whereas platform building is permanent. If you can build 
an established platform that gives you the ability to reach readers, then that's a powerful marketing tool in the future. Um, I want you to think about uh, this term that I invented called viral catalyst. Because viral catalysts amplify word of mouth. And let's take a look at what a viral catalyst is. I define viral catalyst in my free ebook, The Secrets Ebook Publishing Success. And I'd encourage you to go download the book today at the tremendous price of free. Um, the, in The Secrets Ebook Publishing Success, I identify about 30 best practices of the most commercially successful ebook authors. And these are all best practices that you can emulate today. Um, many of these best practices. Um, are the best practices of the large traditional publishers. But um, you'll also find that some of the best practices that we identify are best practices that have been pioneered by self-published authors just over the last couple of years. So definitely check out this book. Um, the book talks about this, this concept of viral catalyst. So a viral catalyst is anything that makes your book more available, more accessible, more desirable, and more enjoyable to readers. I want you to imagine your book as this amorphous blob and attached to your book are um, dozens of dials, levers, and knobs that you can twist, turn, and tweak to make your book more available, more accessible, more desirable, more enjoyable to readers. If you can get the formula just right, your book can go viral. And when a book goes viral, uh, that's another way of saying uh, the book is generating word of mouth. You want to generate super fans. So you don't want someone to read your book and just say, oh, you know, it was pretty good. You want someone to read your book and go, wow, wow. Because wow books get five star reviews. Wow books. Motify, motivate readers to not only um, recommend your book to their friends, but to command their friends to read your book and to read your book now. And we've all experienced wow books and word of mouth recommendations from our friends who told us, you've got to read this book now. And those are the books that we generally read. So let's talk about what some of the um, examples of, of, of viral catalysts are. If you get if you if you get the viral catalyst just right, then your book is more accessible to the readers. They're more likely to take a chance on the book. So many of these viral many of the viral catalysts we've already discussed here in this presentation. So the cover image. When R.L. Mathewson upgraded her cover image, it reduced that unnecessary friction that was preventing readers from taking a chance on her book. And then when they took a chance on her book, they loved her book because she's a great writer and she writes wow books. Um, broad distribution. If your book isn't available everywhere, you're going to reach fewer readers. Um, you want a fair price. If you price your book too high, you're creating unnecessary friction that will prevent some readers from taking a chance on your book. Um, good categorization. Categorization, as I mentioned earlier, helps the retailer determine what virtual shelf to place your book. Um, professional editing. If you can afford professional editing, you should get your book professionally edited because edited books are going to do better than books that haven't been edited. So those are some of the, some of the examples and you can see the rest here. Um, any place any time that you make a mistake on any of these different viral catalysts, any time that you do it wrong, you're creating friction that can um, diminish your your um, your opportunity. So think of all these things as dials, knobs, and levers that you can twist, turn, and tweak. If you feel like your book isn't selling well enough and maybe your cover image is not making the appropriate promise to readers, try a new cover. If you think your your book cover description is not making the appropriate promise to readers or it's not punchy enough, um, update your book description. So continue to iterate until you get the formula right. Um, keep at it 
keep improving your book, and um, eventually um, you'll start reaching readers. So we've come to the end of the presentation. Let's talk about your plan forward as an indie author. The publishing industry is in flux. We've talked about you know five trends that, that are impacting the future of publishing. Uh, these trends are going to benefit indie authors. These, will, these trends will benefit you if you take advantage of them. Um, these trends are going to disadvantage authors who continue to publish through traditional publishers. Um, so that's you know something to think about. If, if you're working with a traditional publisher and they're pricing your book too high, then they're creating unnecessary friction that will prevent readers from taking a chance on your book. I want you to recognize that you, as a writer, you are the future of publishing. One thing that we've witnessed over the last five years, and the reason I founded Smashwords to begin with, is I wanted to transfer the, pub the power in publishing from publishers to writers where the power belongs. And this is now happening. As a writer, you can start writing a book today with the full confidence that your book is going to see the light of day. Your book is going to be published because you're in control and you have choices now that you never had before. You can choose to self-publish and you can self-publish with pride and you can self-publish with professionalism or you can choose to work with a traditional publisher. Either option is fine as long as you enter that option with your eyes wide open and it's great to have options. You have a right to publish. Now this is a radical idea for the traditional publishing industry which has been operating essentially the same way for centuries. Most traditional publishers see most authors as not good enough, as not worthy. But you are worthy. I don't care if your book has a commercial potential market of a single reader, your book has a right to be published. You are your own gatekeeper. So as a self-published writer, you are the one who will decide when your manuscript graduates to become a published book. No one else can make that decision but you now. So I want you to honor your readers. I want you to write a super fabulous book and I want you to publish it faster and with lower prices and better covers than the traditional publishers. If you do that you've got a shot. But I also want you to recognize that the the road ahead is not going to be easy. You know all of us read the same stories about self-published published authors who came out of nowhere and suddenly they're selling millions of books and making millions of dollars and paying off their mortgages and their husbands are retiring because they're, they're making lots of money selling self-published ebooks. Those people are the lottery winners. Those people are rare. Most self-published books do not sell well, just as most traditionally published books don't sell well. So for you to become a successful self-published author it's going to require a lot of work. You are going to have to write books that bring your readers to emotionally satisfying extremes. I don't care if you're writing romance, thrillers, or a, a nonfiction cookbook you need to thrill your reader. You need to write a wow book. That book needs to be better than what New York is putting out. And you can do it. The knowledge is out there to help you do that if you apply your talent to it. So your opportunity to reach readers has never been greater than it is today. I think this is the best time in history to be a writer. I want you to think about the billions of people around the world who will now have access to your books that could never have accessed your books in the old print world. In Africa, India, China, smartphones are becoming 
the standard phones. Anyone who's walking around with a smartphone is walking around with a bookstore in their pocket. Your book is a couple clicks away from being discovered, sampled, or purchased. And because it's an ebook, you can offer these readers the opportunity to read your book at a dramatically lower price than they could with print. So you have a global market that you can reach today. And this market will only get larger over time. So um, these are the three books that I've written. And I would encourage you to go download them all and read them all today um, if you haven't read them already. The first one I wrote is The Style Guide. It teaches you how to format and publish an ebook with Smashwords. Uh, the second book I wrote is the Smashwords Book Marketing Guide. I give you 41 ideas on how to market and promote your book and how to build your author platform. And all of these ideas are free. They don't cost you anything to take advantage of these ideas. Um, just your, your time and your effort. And then the most recent book is The Secrets to Ebook Publishing Success with the Best Practices. Excuse me. So... That's it. That's the end of the presentation. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I enjoyed sharing this with you. And um, please look out for other Smashwords videos, more tutorials coming soon. Um, this is the first video I produced um, of, of a presentation. Over the last five years, I've given dozens of presentations at writers conferences and I usually upload those presentations to a service called SlideShare where you'll find lots of lots of my presentations but those are static presentations so this is the first time I've put together a presentation um, where you have my audio as well and so hopefully um, you found this beneficial if you've enjoyed the video um, please tell a friend that would be the biggest compliment you can give me, is just share it with a friend. I'm really interested here to help as many writers around the world recognize um, how they can professionally publish an ebook and achieve their dreams as a writer. Thanks for listening.